Welcome back, beautiful tri-state area. You're listening to A Moment of Zen right here on 710 WOR, the voice of New York iHeartRadio. I'm your host, Zen Sams. Coming up in our Healthy Minutes segment brought to you by Metropolitan Lifestyles, we're chatting with Amy Kennedy, Education Director of the Kennedy Forum, proud mom, wife to Patrick Kennedy, and a true trailblazer in her field. Today, she's joined by the amazing Dr. Robert Melillo, one of the world's most sought after and respected experts in developmental functional neurology, brain imbalances, hemispheric integration, and the correction of most neurobehavioral disorders and learning disabilities. He's a prolific author and brain researcher with five best-selling books, including his best-known Disconnected Kids, which has been translated into 10 languages. Today, we're chatting about the dramatic rise in autism spectrum disorder in children as new CDC data revealed an increase in the prevalence of autism across the U.S. The report shows in 2020, one out of every 36 children in America was diagnosed with autism. Autism is defined by the CDC as a developmental disability that can cause significant social communication and behavioral challenges. In recent years, there has been a major effort to improve screening, awareness, and access to services in historically underserved communities. That means that more Black, Hispanic, and Asian children are now being diagnosed. Here to chat why autism is on the rise and the importance of proper screening and early diagnosis are my experts at hand, Dr. Robert Melillo, an education director of the Kennedy Forum. Amy Kennedy, welcome to the show, my friends. Thank you for having us. Great to be with you. Autism rates in the U.S. are skyrocketing, but especially in California. And according to the ADDM network, the Autism and Developmental Disabilities Monitoring Network, currently the median age of the first diagnosis across most states for eight-year-olds was a bit over four years old. Just in California, the age was three years old, which means children in this state are getting diagnosed quicker. Why is this the case? And are autism rates skyrocketing because we are now screening more? Or is there a medical reason behind these increased rates? You know, that's obviously a complicated question. I spent a lot of time researching this. My third book called Autism, The Scientific Truth is all about this. It's really about what is what causes or what are the risk factors that can increase the risk of a diagnosis. And uh, so in that book, I, I Research it for a long time, spoke to a number of epidemiologists, especially in California. And the, the simple answer is, is that um, only about 48 to 50 percent of the increase or the rise in autism can be attributed to better recognition, earlier diagnosis, um, other factors like migration or clustering. So that means that 50 percent or more is unexplained. And so that means that it is really more environmentally based. Um, We know that primarily it's being driven by environmental factors, lifestyle factors that are affecting a rise in in other areas like diabetes or obesity or uh, other types of, uh, of, you know, lifestyle based illnesses. So we know that, you know, that you don't have such a thing as a genetic epidemic. Um, And the other thing is that the vast majority of parents with children with autism are not diagnosed with autism, even though some of them may have a trait. So it's not due to changes in genetic mutations or anything like that. So it is a real rise, meaning we're seeing more children with autism than ever before. We went from one in 10,000 30 years ago to now, as you said, one in 36 And it's even less than that. It's one in 20 something boys at this point in time. And it's going to continue to rise because until we really understand and start really taking charge of what is driving it and really understanding what is actually happening in the brain, um, I don't think we're going to see much of a change in this, to be honest. Yes, and you're right. And it's extremely important to start screening earlier and to really implement this. I mean, we saw with California, I mean, specifically, if you look at some children in San Diego, they're diagnosed with autism by their second birthday and connected to services quickly thereafter. So in this particular case, you know, it's great news because the sooner that they can be connected to services and support, the more likely they are to thrive later on, right? So of course, that portion of the statistic that the 50% that 
that the increase in rates is coming from earlier screening, this is a great case point that San, San Diego is, is trailblazing there. Now, Amy, aside from state lines, uh, there are differences in race and ethnicity as well. All previous CDC reports have shown that white children were identified with the condition, with the condition more often than others. And this is the first year that shows the opposite. The researchers found that autism rates are higher in all minorities and, uh, you know, when they say that there's been an increase, uh, my question to you is, does that mean an increase in screening and advocacy? What changed in these minorities? Yeah, and I think it's not just in minorities. I think it's also in girls. We saw that there was an increase there as well because uh, we've been able to, I think, reduce some of the not just stigma around it, but the misconceptions about what it might look like and how the symptoms might differ uh, based on gender or ethnicity. So people are able to identify sooner and, as you said, get that treatment as soon as possible, which makes uh, for better outcomes. But I think that the early screening that Dr. Malillo talked about is going to be a key to figuring out how we can um, make a difference in the treatment and identify some of those causes that we have not been able to do at this point. It's interesting because this is the first of a kind finding in terms of these statistics, right, that we're seeing. And it's exciting because it, it although 50% is, you know, to Dr. Malillo's point, we don't know, but the other 50% um, suggests that a movement towards equity in services for all children on the spectrum. I mean, historically, a lot of children of color, you know, have been assigned inappropriate diagnoses um, or their autism expression has been misperceived as behavioral and, and they've been really shot into not special ed, but into more rigid behavioral programs, often with really tragic consequences. And, and this is a relief because it represents the idea that some of these children who were lost in these systems may actually be finding their way home. So it's, it's promising in many respects. Now, Dr. Malolo, you created Brain Balance Achievement Centers back in 2006 real true pioneer in your field, which has approximately 150 centers and has helped tens of thousands of families and also now created the Malilo Center for Developing Minds. Um, and you see patients in private practice all over the globe, both adults and children. Are we any closer to finding what causes autism spectrum disorder? You are the expert here. Yeah, I'd like to think that because I've been doing a ton of research in this area. We just published five papers over the last six months. And we just completed a four-year randomized age match control double blind study looking at the relationship between something called retained primitive reflexes and autism. And we've done advanced brain imaging before and after and also neuropsych testing. Um, and what we're looking for is, you know, for me, it's always been about what is autism? What is actually happening in the brain? And quite honestly, there are very few people in the world that really are looking at and understanding it and with the mindset of what do we do about it how do we change that core issue and that's been my work and you know i opened like you said brain balance 2006 but i've been working on that for more than 15 20 years before and and you know brain balance was really geared towards a higher functioning population or really it wasn't really directed initially towards the autism community but the Melillo Center and the Melillo Method, which I've developed now over the past seven years, has been really directed towards understanding in the most severe, and I don't even want to use that term, but in the most cases where non-speaking autism or even other issues like genetic issues or seizure disorders or things like that, really understanding what is happening in the brain. What is the actual problem? Why do we see in autism such genius level skills at almost any level, even kids that are really, really, you know, seem compromised, they have genius level skills when they're able to communicate. And yet they're so deficient in some things. And there's this wide variety, which is the, the you know, the whole spectrum that we see. So, you know, we're, we're planning on publishing at least, you know, eight to 10 papers on this this year. And what we've been able to understand is that there's this developmental imbalance between networks in the brain. There's no damage, there's no pathology, there's no genetic mutation the majority of the time. There is this imbalance superimposed on traits that these kids are brilliant, mostly with their left brain skills, 
and their left brain networks are overconnected and overactive and their right brain networks are underdeveloped and immature, this creates this disconnection between their networks and that can be restored or at least it can be significantly improved. So I'd like to believe that our work is leading the way in really understanding what the problem is because if you're not dealing with the core issue, you know, you, you're really just kind of managing behaviors and symptoms, which is good, but I think everybody would like to say, well, let's deal with the core issue if we can. Fascinating. Wow. That was brilliant. I, I love that answer. Great. We should, we, that, that was a segment in of itself. Uh, Amy, the CDC officials also pointed out the impact of the pandemic, right? So I want to, although what he said was so poignant and spot on, I'm going to just, just, shift a little bit here. Um, and they pointed out the impact of the pandemic, pointing out that up until March of 2020, there was very good progress in early um, identification, early detection of autism in younger children. And of course, after March of 2020, they saw a dramatic drop off. And they're worried now about long lasting effects. What are those effects that they're worried about? You see this firsthand as a parent, as a, an educator at the Kennedy Forum. And why is early detection so important? It's really important uh, to be able to get people the supports they need early. 50% of children with uh, severe symptoms are not using any behavioral interventions. There's a, still a lack of early diagnosis and appropriate treatment. And it's very isolating, not only for the individual, but for their whole family. So being able to get those interventions, get support for the caregivers is really um, going to significantly change the whole family's life. Um, direct support for caregivers through coaching programs and peer groups uh, will make a big difference. But as you know, it's all about parity, making sure that there's insurance coverage for those interventions, making sure that there is enough trained professionals to be able to help individuals who are struggling and being able to have those screenings in place um, and really uh, good diagnostic tools when it comes to autism. And of course, that's all extremely important, but what about these long, these long lasting effects that everybody's worried about? I mean, what would you speak to of that? Well, we know that not only do it, are individuals impacted by the autism, but that they can struggle with comorbidities. So, um, behavioral comorbidities, both from the pandemic, um, things like depression, uh, ADHD, and others, anxiety disorder that we're seeing in the general population are also impacting those with autism. So I think that um, only exacerbates the condition and makes it more difficult for people to seek help as it progresses. Well said. Thank you so much. That was uh, that was extremely well said, and and it, it really just begins with community and activism and and really advocating here in the right direction. We are out of time. Don't move a muscle. We'll be right back after this. But I wanted to thank both of you for coming on. It was very very enlightening talking with both of you. Thank you. What an insightful segment. Amazing stuff. That was My Healthy Minutes brought to you by Metropolitan Lifestyles. Do check out Amy Kennedy at the thekennedyforum.org. And of course, you must check out Dr. Robert Melillo at his website, drrobertmelillo.com, or check out his handle at Dr. Robert Melillo. You're listening to A Moment of Zen right here on 710 WOR, the voice of New York, iHeartRadio. We'll be right back after this. Hi, this is Kathy Ireland here on A Moment of Zen, brought to you by Your Home TV. We've developed an all-inclusive subscription-free network that you're going to love, whether it's financial freedom, fashion, beauty, health and wellness, wonderful weddings, travel and culture, cooking, entertainment, and short-form documentaries, programming for everyone. Classic films and new shows, including Kathy Ireland Presents American Dreams. We've developed this network just for you. Please check out yourhometv.com. Welcome back, beautiful tri-state area. You're listening to A Moment of Zen right here on 710 WOR, the voice of New York iHeartRadio. Welcoming back to the show is Dr. Melillo and Amy Kennedy. Welcome back, my friends. Thank you. All right, guys, let's jump right back into it. So this, uh, we're, we're chatting about um, autism on the rise. 
We've covered a whole bunch of information here. And the this last particular uh, portion is really geared towards um, your advice. And Amy and Dr. Malolo, the fuller picture here being painted, what we've been talking about is there's more children in particular who will need more help. And there's not enough help there to offer them right now. So for families who receive a diagnosis, uh, knowing what you know about the emotional and the financial toll this can take, uh, what's your best guidance to them right now? Um, Dr. Malila, we'll start with you. You know, get the appropriate treatment and get it as early as possible. One of the things I loved, loved a lot of the things that Amy said. And, you know, one of the interesting things is, you know, for years we've all known about early intervention, but now, you know, the CDC comes out with a statement about looking at milestones, which to me is actually a very, very key marker for parents to identify an issue in their children very early. And now they've completely changed that and they've eliminated crawling as a milestone, which is crazy. So what they've done is they've actually, you know, expanded it and they've kind of kicked it down the road, letting parents think that, you know, it's okay if your child doesn't really speak until 30 months, you know, which is not, not, you know, proper. And for me, early motor milestone, you know, is very important. Many babies can't latch on and can't suck. Many of those children go on to be autistic or have some other disability. So, you know, getting that early diagnosis, but getting the proper treatment. And I'd like to believe that more and more, you know, we're going to be talking about what is actually happening in the brain. What can we do to change it? Like a simple thing, like recognizing retained primitive reflexes, which is what we do, which is a way to identify these reflexes that we're all born with that don't go away virtually 100% of the time in kids with autism and teaching parents or professionals simple ways of stimulating those reflexes can get rid of them. And that alone has a huge impact on the growth and development of the brain. Um, that's a simple procedure that costs literally almost nothing. Um, and, you know, but it is, it's about, you know, getting this information out there and researching, which is what I'm trying to do. But looking at, you know, coming up with treatments that are really going to be effective and getting them as early as possible, whatever that may be. Brilliant. Amy, what's your take on this? What's your advice from a mother's perspective, from you sit on the board of a very important foundation? Uh, this is what you do all day, every day. Uh, what's your advice to uh, families out there who receive this diagnosis or don't receive the diagnosis or are in, you know, in limbo? Um, there's an emotional and a financial toll that this definitely takes because, you know, resources are expensive and quite often the coverage that we have is not sufficient. So what is your advice? That's right. Uh, you know, I think to that point, it's, making sure that we're front loading all of these interventions, you know, before age six, we're doing as much as we can because it will pay long-term um, in the way that the child develops. So being able to incentivize that in our policies uh, nationwide, continuing to bring awareness about this will be key, but also building out community supports. I mentioned, earlier that, you know, this can be very isolating for families and looking for ways that the community can support um, the whole family and make sure that caregivers are having what they need because this can be very time consuming and make it difficult for them to be part of um, all of the activities that are offered. So looking for ways that we can encourage different locations to be sensitive to those with autism that may have different sensory needs and how we can build out a, um, a supportive environment regardless of where they go. But I would always encourage people to look at what policies they can speak up and influence in their own community, in their state, and of course federally to continue to fund the, both the research and the reimbursements. Plethora of resources, the two of you today. Plethora of resources. Well, we are officially, officially out of time. Thank you, my dear friends, for coming on. Two amazing, incredible individuals, trailblazers in your field, respectively. It was an incredible honor to chat with you today. Your mind is brilliant. I love what you're doing. And Amy, you know how I feel about you. Nothing but love Thank to your you. mama. Thank you.
Thank you, Zen. That was My Healthy Minutes brought to you by Metropolitan Lifestyles. Do check out Amy Kennedy at the thekennedyforum.org. And of course, you must check out Dr. Robert Melillo at his website, drrobertmelillo.com, or check out his handle at Dr. Robert Melillo. You're listening to A Moment of Zen right here on 710 WOR, the voice of New York, iHeartRadio. We'll be right back after this. <laughs> 